uh, I should also introduce Stephen Smale. He received the Fields Medal in, when was that? It was early, it was in 1966, actually, when I started my studies. And he received the Fields Medal for his work in differential topology, in particular, improving the Poincaré conjecture for dimensions big O equal to five. So that was a kind of, when I started, one of the biggest results I could imagine. But at, at that time, he was also a hero to me because of his engagement against the Vietnam War. That's a long time ago. But he is also known for that engagement. Later, he turned his interest uh, also to computer science and to complexity theory and his work uh, uh, to, uh, with, about Turing. And that's what he is going to talk about, uh, about Turing and his interest in it. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. It's a uh, great pleasure to be back in Heidelberg for this forum again. So, uh, in, in a way, I'm talking about uh, Turing as an inspiration for me, uh, among other scientists. Uh, well, with partly the goal of answering the question, who am I? Because, you know, as a mathematician, uh, you know, I don't think that I fit the, uh, the label of applied mathematician at all, and I think conversely applied mathematics doesn't see me as an applied mathematician. On the other hand, I certainly am not a pure mathematician, so what am I? <laughs> I think I am a mathematician, but <laughs> I don't fit that dichotomy. And so this talk has a little bit to do with trying to see a, this kind of mathematics that I do, which has been inspired especially by uh, Turing. But also, I will talk a little bit about the influence of these other people who have inspired me, Newton and uh, von Neumann and uh, the uh, Watson-Crick pair. So I'm bringing those in, too. And it has to do with this question about my work. So often, I'm asked about these, uh, what some people might call models or mathematization of some subjects. And they say, uh, they ask me, is, you know, is it realistic? And I have a, a big problem with that question. Uh, for me, it's a question more of being idealistic. So I want to contrast this kind of different philosophy of idealism versus realism. So I'm not trying to make a realistic uh, aspect of, of a certain subject, but I would like to idealize a lot when I develop that subject through my whole career, essentially. I'm thinking now of mathematics as uh, embedded in the very large body of science and even outside of science. So mathematics for me has got this wide uh, area of its relationships. OK, uh, so let's see a little bit how this relates to Turing. And there are two examples I can think of. Turing has been a great help for me in theory of computation, but also his theory of morphogenesis. But both share the same aspect. Turing's theory of computation, I think, is great. It's inspiring. But is it realistic? I think most people might agree with me that it is not. It's idealizations. It's great because it idealized just a few key things about computation. Uh, it, you know, certainly uh, in real life, computation is not uh, unlimited. It's, got, it's finite. 
and uh, the, everything in the real life is so finite, but a Turing machine is not. And it's a little bit more pervasive in applications of mathematics and physics and within mathematics. This notion of taking the limit as time goes to infinity is extremely uh, insightful. But time doesn't go to infinity, at least in our lifetimes. So that this is another idealiz idealization, but leads to a great insights throughout math. So those are the kinds of things I, I feel that idealization captures. OK, uh, and with Turing, this, this idea of a theory of computation, a theory which is measured with Turing more literally is a number of bits in a computation. Or in a, a version of a computation that I've worked out with Lenore Blum, Mike Schub, and also with Felipe Kuker, we use arithmetic operations. And so some aspects, many, some might argue most, but scientific computation where differential equations are involved, then it's the uh, arithmetic operations that, that, that count. For example, I'm thinking just of the problem of measuring uh, how long it will take for Newton's method to converge to a zero of a polynomial, polynomial, a single polynomial of a real variable, how to understand Newton's method as a method of computation. For that, I think Turing uh, does not give insights to that problem. But in other aspects of uh, science and life, the Turing uh, bit model is, is, exactly, uh, is exactly the right uh, form for that. OK, but so the point I want to make is that Turing theory of computation idealizes a lot. And it's important for success. The whole theory, for example, of NP completeness is based on I infinite input size. Again, uh, idealization, a big idealization. But still, the, th the theory of NP completeness gives us a lot of understanding and uh, ideas about what can't be computable. So it's, these idealizations are great. But I think to say, is Turing realistic? I'd say no. OK. Uh, but it's not just Turing. I'm thinking also of Newton. Newton's uh, laws of physics, his def uh, differential equations of mechanics. Uh, there, uh, is that an idealization? And I would say that's a, except for maybe the uh, astronomical aspects, it's a gross idealization. For example, uh, it took 100 years after Newton to in integrate in friction. And if you're going to apply laws of motion and so on, or, Newton's uh, laws to phenomena in the, uh, on Earth, uh, you need to really take into account friction. And uh, Newton did not. And it, that took 100 years before it was incorporated. So he, uh, Newton, what Newton did was idealize away friction when he talked about the apple, apple falling. Now, uh, similar thing is going on with von Neumann. Von Neumann's uh, idealizations and his models of quantum mechanics. See, I think Newton, the, the von Neumann, did something that's not appreciated so well. Uh, but his work on the foundations of quantum mechanics, he introduced the notion, uh, the notion of Hilbert space. The concept of Hilbert space was first really elucidated by von Neumann in his work on quantum mechanics. I think oftentimes, these days, uh, that's not recognized. They will say von Neumann made the definition of Hilbert space, but that undercuts the importance of the introduction of the concept of a Hilbert space. But that certainly was a huge idealization of what was going on in quantum mechanics, but extraordinarily you saw not too many decades later, because then it led to the whole theory of questions of operators, 
bunches of operators on Hilbert space. So that idealization, again, was the key thing. And one shouldn't ask, it's not so f useful to ask the question, was von Neumann's foundations, was it realistic? OK. Uh, and the other main example I have, since I'm working in uh, biology these days, uh, I'm paying a lot of attention to some kind of foundations of uh, modern biology, especially Watson and Crick. So what were Watson and Crick and their you know, monumental discovery of DNA, that was, uh, you know, people oftentimes don't appreciate what a great idealization that was. See, the theory of DNA, according to Watson and Crick, does not have anything to do with proteins. But the real d the DNA, as discovered a couple of decades later, is wound around a core formed by proteins, called the histone proteins, and those structures are chromatin. So th they are absolutely critical to get this deeper picture, more detailed picture of what is DNA. It's this spiral of the helix around a core of proteins which dictates so much of the physics and chemistry of DNA. That's called, chroma, that's called chromatin, that core. And again, uh, this was a huge idealization. And you know, moreover, uh, this is a phenomenon that one sees, maybe not so much with Newton, but the other examples. Watson and Crick, uh, their work was not addressed to biologists. When I was uh, a student, biology was divided into two parts, uh, botany and zoology. And they had, uh, biologists as a whole, or almost all, had no knowledge of chemistry. And uh, Watson Crick published in I think maybe the magazine uh, Nature. And uh, it was uh, addressed to chemists. And I think it took a long time before the biologists really uh, appreciated it or could read it. I think even the chemists took a while, except for maybe Pauling. So uh, anyway, these idealizations, I think, are crucial. And my own work goes around these gross idealizations. So I'm not trying to make realistic models. And even when it comes to predictions, uh, I think predictions are OK. But uh, all of the examples I've mentioned did not make predictions. And in fact, the, the models I gave didn't hardly even uh, had laboratory experiments. These pioneers did not use laboratory exper experiments, their own at least, but they used uh, data that had been accumulated before them. And that's I think is great. But I'm using the data from biology. Uh, there's a, such a vast amount of data in biology. So my perspective is to use that data, but not raw data. That data from biology has been uh, digested and incorporated into articles by biologists to see a lot of down-to-earth phenomena in biology where the data is behind it, but it's, you might say, second order, because the output of the data is in these papers biologists write, and uh, that's what I depend on a lot in biology, is to use that kind of uh, data that's been accumulated. And the same, I think, goes for Newton also. Uh, he used the data accumulated by Galileo, Copernicus and Kepler before him, mostly. I don't think he really was doing much experiments himself, but he put it, used that data to put together a very beautiful, unified picture of physics, of mechanics. Anyway, those are my inspirations, and I try to follow a little bit in those footsteps. OK, uh, so. Maybe I should give a little bit of illustration of what I'm saying in terms of my current work in biology. Uh, so I've written, uh, let's see if I can 
use these things. I've written papers with Invica. This isn't too dark. Uh, Raj Epoxy. Okay, so this joint, three joint papers we have published, and we're working on one now. So the one I'm working on with Indica is the following. I want to understand uh, the heart. Uh, I want to understand how the heart beats. And so this is a, an old problem. Uh, beating in unison is a, a nickname of the problem. Why does the heart beat in unison? Unison means how do all these myocytes in the heart, all these cells in the heart, called myocytes, part of the populations of cells in the heart, maybe half. They, e they each have their own rhythm, uh, sort of independent, and, but somehow they get together and cooperate to obtain a full uh, beating heart. So the heartbeat uh, is associated to the coordinated action of uh, these uh, myocytes, these cells in the heart. So what we want to do is to give some kind of a uh, deeper understanding of that phenomena through mathematics. And again, uh, a big part of that is due to the work of Turing. Turing has an article, has a article written, maybe his last paper before he died, on, uh, on morphogenesis. And he's got some differential equations in there that uh, he used, and maybe people after him, to understand stripes on a zebra and so on. And so we're using, well, a development of those equations. Actually, uh, it wasn't too many years after that paper that I wrote a paper on the, the same, using the same system of Turing's equations for, you know, to give some other understanding. Turing's equations were also a big idealization. He assumed they're all linear, which he, I don't think you can get too far in biology using only linear differential equations. And what happened, it was okay for what he was doing because he was uh, looking at the limit of an uh, infinite number of cells, and in this infinite limit, he got uh, partial differential equations. And those partial differential equations, he could see uh, these patterns in animals. And that has become a big subject ever since. But I think most biologists did not, uh, did not appreciate Turing, and with good reason. Because morphogenesis is something that's involving what's happening with just a few cells. One, two, three. Uh, em embryogenesis. That's where the, th the new, uh, the new uh, animals are formed, starting with just a few cells. And when you take the continuum limit of cells to get the PDE, that's not, not useful. And that's why I think the biologists, biologists have uh, not paid attention to that paper. And I think that's right. So I think morphogenesis involves what happens just on the cell cycle where one cell is turned into two cells, one perhaps differentiated, and you begin to see a morphogenesis in those terms. Okay, uh, so for this problem of beating in the heart, uh, this is part of a huge area of investigation going back 100 years to Huygens, but uh, especially developed by Arthur Winfrey the Biology of Time, his book. And it has a lot to do with synchroni synchronization. For example, uh, when people clap for very long, they start clapping in unison. They synchronize. And uh, there are many, many other phenomena where you see this synchronization effect of uh, a lot of people doing the same thing, but where it's not synchronized, then it becomes synchronized. And that's a 
been a beautiful and big subject. Okay, so for uh, me, uh, there is a background to this. There was some work I did uh, with Indica. I, there are three papers of Indica that I can refer you to, but the one paper had to do with the uh, tissues. Tissues are like an organ of the body. Could be heart, but we were thinking more like the liver. And to, to understand how the liver functions. So we were working on the problem of the function of, uh, of a tissue. Now the tissues are made up of cells, all of the same cell type, but they're uh, a priori not necessarily coordinated. But wh what's going on in tissues, and the heart too, are proteins. Proteins play a, a big role in function, the main, the main role, in fact. So uh, in a t uh, cell type, that means uh, cell types are those that are uh, working in a single tissue. Uh, one finds the, the basic proteins for uh, the function of that tissue. So what we did uh, in that paper that's published a few months ago was to see how that would work, how they would synchronize with those proteins to be able to function together in a tissue. Could be the liver or anywhere. Uh, and that relied, that, that work relied on earlier work and this was the beginning of a big sequence of idealizations. The earlier work was to construct in the genome. So we have the genome in each cell, the set of genes, and the, those genes uh, are all listed. They're all, all, they're all known. Biologists know them all. But uh, how they work, they work together. So one has to study Think the, uh, how, how these uh, how these proteins are uh, working to get, working in the cell, and that's going to be given by a, a system of differential equations, which goes back even before Watson Crick. Differential equations which regulate either mRNA or proteins. It's not too, they are not too much different. Okay, for the equation, the, those differential equations we constructed in a paper uh, oh, just a year or two ago. All these references you can find out on the internet. So what we did was to construct ordinary differential equations for the system of uh, gene activity in a single cell. Uh, so it's the differential equations on the values of the output of this gene network. So that it's based on the notion of transcription factor, which is a central gene which controls other genes. So you make the nodes of a network, as of computer science, into the genes themselves. And to each node, you associate the, a concentration, for uh, say, of proteins. So it'll be a positive real number. Okay, then on that, we want to have this differential equation on the whole set of 20,000 genes. Okay, so, uh, so this goes back a long way, but what we did was to formalize that, which is very useful to have for us later, to have this formal picture of a dynamical system or ordinary differential equation on this 20,000 dimen 20, dimensional space. And so we started out with building a graph, a network, graph in the sense of computer science, so that each node corresponded to a gene. And we would get edges, directed edges, when one when a transcription factor is controlling a target gene. There are about 10,000. Uh, transcription factors are few, not much over 1,000 transcription factors, but they can target a number of genes. And when they target a gene, they can elevate the activity initiate that activity of the target gene. And you can write the differential equations, which are quite old, go back 100 years, uh, Hill equations, which uh, say how that works. And what we did was to put all that together in the, in the network. And from the network, then we're able to get a single system of differential equations 
which tell us how the genes regulate each other, mainly from going from the transcription factors to the target genes. So uh, elements of that go way, way back, but uh, people, scientists have never done anything uh, systematic or you know, something, uh, I would say, maybe bold or wrong to write down the differential equations for the whole genome in this way. So that's what we did. And uh, we were the first to say that this was a vast idealization. And I think, uh, to a certain extent, biologists could understand that, most but not all. We were ad idealizing drastically. I mean, there were, we recognized in our model some inputs from outside of the, uh, of the cell, signals coming from outside of the cell, and some other things. But uh, one thing that came out of this, maybe the same paper or the next paper, was this notion of hardwiring of the genome. And I think this is, didn't shock biologists, but they did, had never formalized it. But we were able to formalize the notion of hardwiring. So let me explain a bit about that. Hardwiring uh, has to do with the original idea that every cell in every human and every organ consists of the same genes. It's universal. So uh, this is well understood by biologists. But what we said, more is true. The system of equations is hardwired. So that uh, essentially in every cell and every human, you have the same differential equations operating on the genes. OK, uh, one has to do that with a little care, because some some uh, tissues, some of these edges will be silenced. So one has to take that into account. They're silenced by chromatin, essentially. So one has to be a little uh, careful about just how extensive this goes. But the idea is, in the same tissue, same cell type now, uh, they will all be uh, silent together or active together. That's what makes up the characteristic of a tissue. OK, so what? Let's see, I guess I don't have too much time. So uh, what we did is to use this hardwiring hypothesis. Uh, and we did it in two ways. In our paper that was published, we made this second very drastic idealization of the, what those equations look like. We said in each cell, there's going to be a single basin equilibrium. So all the equa equations have solutions, almost all, which will go to that equilibria. So it's a, a global basin. And the basin is uh, going to be, have uh, then a description in terms of the, the variables, which would be the proteins. So that, that uh, equilibrium describes a comp uh, the, the composition of the proteins, which fits because in the uh, cell type, all the proteins have the same, uh, same composition, the same, uh, same ratios. Same, they're all, all uh, the same. The mounts are the same as you go over uh, cells of the same cell type or in a single organism, like the liver. So we made that hypothesis. Again, drastic idealization. Uh, and that began to disturb some biologists, not others. <laughs> but I think it was consistent with uh, known biology very much. And part of what we're doing is trying to give uh, some suggestions of co which uh, make different parts of biology consistent and give some kind of uh, insights into the workings of biology in a broader sense. And so uh, this is what we were trying to do, and I think with some success. So that was a hypothesis we made. And then we used, uh, then we proved a theorem using these equations of Turing extended to these nonlinear uh, equations, which we needed to describe the equilibria, to describe uh, what's going on in each cell. So we extended, uh, yeah, so what we did then was to get some kind of theorem 
with some kind of newer hypothesis, we call it monotonicity. It wasn't, it wasn't an old hypothesis of monotonicity. It was a new one which we expressed mathematically. And with that hypothesis on the actions of these cells, then we were able to get, uh, by using the Turing equations, which took into account diffusion between the cells, we were able to get this coordination of function. So we got uh, the function of the tissue described now by all the cells working together. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, then more recently, uh, this suggested, well, to me at first, that we could do the same thing to get this problem of beating of the uh, beating in unison for the, describing the heart. And uh, actually, uh, somebody came from Hong Kong, a young woman, Lin Lu, to work with me. Uh, she was an undergraduate in Hong Kong. But uh, so in June, she came to work with me on some problem, and I suggested to her that she work on the uh, genome uh, of the heart, of the heart muscles. So I learned a lot over one month of talking to her about this problem. She did a lot of research. I did too, but that gave me some picture where there are two proteins that are fundamental for the heartbeat, actin and myosin. And so then we're able to use uh, some computation to see uh, that this fit together pretty well with Turing's equation where you had diffusion given by a transport about through membranes. So you get a uh, Laplacian defined by a, uh, a, met a matrix, uh, which is a, a, what's it called, I guess, a, a neighborhood ma matrix, uh, adjacency matrix, uh, essentially done by uh, transport of the uh, proteins through membranes. And so nearby uh, these myocytes, these cells in the heart, they will be, have a membrane-type diffusion affecting them. And you can put all that together to get a nice uh, Laplacian defined. And that Laplacian has an averaging effect then on the proteins. And one has to be careful because there are counterexamples. We found counterexamples. But uh, with this volatonicity hypothesis, we were able to get this coordination. And then uh, that was... Uh, Oh, when you had an equilibrium. Now for the heartbeat, we have to make a little broader hypothesis on the dynamics. It's going to be now a stable periodic solution to represent the heartbeat. And each myocyte does have, each of these cells in the heart, they do have such a, uh, such a rhythm that's known. In fact, a lot of these things were known you know, biologically and so on, but they hadn't been put together very well mathematically, not, not at all. So uh, there was some appreciation that maybe uh, the fusion between the myocytes could give rise to the heartbeat, but uh, it was actually using those Turing equations that were able to, and this is our work in progress, see the uh, things I would say, we can see the end of the tunnel, and we are beginning to have a theory emerge, which will give some kind of model of the heart being in rhythm. Thank you very much.